Tourette's podcast is not a medical advice show. It's a show about experiences. In the course of that, we may talk about medications or therapies or stories from the doctor's office, but don't mistake any of that for medical advice or direction. It's not. Get that only from people or places licensed or certified to give it. Not from a massively fun and action-packed podcast about our life experiences. Such as. Students are much more respectful than adults, I learned, to be honest with you when you're out and about. It's just, it's, it's, it's nice. You know, we always think that the students are the, the most naive, but sometimes they're also the smartest, in my opinion. This is Tourette's podcast, made possible with support of the Tourette Association of America and part of the Geeks Rising Network. Hello from the, I guess I'll call it the new Tourette's podcast studio for the time being. If you're a resident of the American South, like I am, you're familiar with the uh, the brutal, muggy heat wave we've had going on, and it marches in like a, like a merciless army. And one of the casualties was the air conditioning system in the podcast studio. I tried to stay put and position some fans around me, and they only served to blow hot air at me. So... I gathered up uh, the most essential recording equipment and found another room downstairs in the AC and got kind of nostalgic because it reminded me of when I was getting into podcasting initially several years ago and trying to figure out, I've got a cat making some noise here, uh, trying to figure out how to sound treat a room on the fly in some DIY way. If, uh, but Because sometimes I get emails about this. If you're interested in the craft of podcasting, well, first off, check out my buddy Bandrew, uh, Podcastage is his YouTube channel. But uh, And I'm sure he'll agree with this. One of the most important first steps before buying audio gear and so on is locating the right room to do it in. A lot of factors contribute to that, like what it's going to sound like. And it's kind of fun if you're a nerd like me. It's, it's a fun process trying to figure out how to choose the right room and make it sound right. Meaning getting rid of the reverb and echo and empty room slap sound by you know, treating the walls with acoustic paneling and so on, covering up all the uh, the hard reflective surfaces. If, if you're like me and you have a task or a project in front of you that requires some strategic thinking, you put off sleep until you're satisfied that you've gotten it done. So glutton for punishment towards some measure of reward so we can keep the podcast going. This is episode 14 of season five, figuring into more than 80 episodes of uh, Tourette's podcast so far, I, I think like 85 just really blows my mind, the ground we've covered. Season five is just, it's, it's been so much fun and so edifying, and the interaction is at a new level, I think. It's maybe honestly really the most important thing in my life, and at this point, we've got just a couple episodes remaining this season. So I'll, I'll probably roll this dough again at the end, but as I was piecing together this new temporary slash probably permanent podcast space here over the past few days and trying to get it to sound good, it's still not quite there yet, but I just thought about it a lot and just want to say thanks to each of you for being here and supporting. I love that we have a really mixed audience. Shout out to uh, my talented buddy, Joey. Hope you're doing well. Okay. I want to keep reminding that the Tourette Association of America has a pretty deep bank of webinars that go into a lot of the topics we, we wonder about here. Like there's a lot of them specifically addressing many of the, the, the questions, concerns, curiosities, woes, and so on at Tourette.org. Click the button right there in the middle of the website that says webinars. And you can see what's coming up when they plan things, but what I'm really highlighting here are the past webinars. You can watch for free, uh, just to mention a few titles here. TS, Mental Health and Resiliency Building, Ticks and Pandemic, Practical Strategies During Home Quarantine, A Discussion on COVID-19 and Managing Anxiety, Transitioning Care to Adulthood, ADHD and Tourette Syndrome, Workplace Accommodations and Disability Rights, Building and Maintaining Positive Partnerships with Your Child's School. Surviving Sensory Overload, Strategies for Families. I'm, I'm skipping around here, just naming the titles I'm looking at. There's a lot here. On the webinars page of Tourette.org. Uh, you can also follow them on YouTube. This is all there. Tons of resources. And if you'd like to support the Tourette Association and being able to produce this kind of material, which helps a lot of people, uh, right next to the webinars button on Tourette.org is another button that says Ways to Give. And you can follow it from there. On this episode, we've got Brian Lane, which I revealed to a few of you ahead of time, and there was a lot of excitement about Brian being on the show. And sorry if my voice sounds weird, I allergies, but anyway, Brian's a teacher, he's an advocate for the TS community, in the academic setting for young people and their families, he's an advocate as well for adults with TS, 
He's someone a lot of you really like, and I'm with you. This conversation, before I knew it, we had already been talking for like 50 minutes. It really flies by. It was just easy and fun, but we hit some real ground. Uh, so many of you have said the reason you listen to Tourette's podcast is that it helps you feel less isolated. That's always the way you say it. Uh, isolated is always the word that comes up or alone. It helps you to feel less alone in your experience. And we dissect this, uh, Brian and I do, that sense of isolation, not just from a negative angle or the downside of it, but also some of the nice things about isolation. I, I don't say that trivially. I don't mean that to come off as disregarding or disrespectful to situations of painful isolation or loneliness or you know situations where a lack of social access can take a toll. Um, I mean this in the context of the occasional joy and even importance of spending time with yourself uninterrupted on your own terms. Saying this through a TS lens, uh, particularly at a young age, and just kind of cracking your own code, I guess. We also talk about sleep or the lack thereof. And I will say, don't take us too seriously with what we get into. Uh, we just talk about our own personal experiences with sleep, or again, lack of experience with sleep. Uh, there's that saying that, you know, we spend about a third of our lives asleep. Not me. And as Brian can attest, not him either. But that alone opens up an interesting discussion. And Brian, just prior to me talking with him here, had just given a virtual presentation with the Tourette Association's Wisconsin chapter about the intersections of school and kids with TS and how parents can be effective there. We talk about that a bit here. Brian is part of TAA's Education Advisory Board. He's fantastic and just really happy to have him. Gotta say here that there is one part in this conversation where I start to say that in the spectrum of solutions and remedies that we explore to help us manage our lives and our diagnoses, that I'll take a placebo effect if I feel like it's working. Like I would invest in something even if the effect is just a placebo to feel like something is working so I can feel better. And I, I want to underline that in saying that, I was saying that in, uh, and we, the, the way we were talking about it in the context of feeling good and feeling relieved and in my case, just happy with myself. Certainly not in the context of medicine where you have to take what's appropriate and right for you. And I'm glad Brian emphasizes what you're going to hear. The importance of doing research into something that claims to provide relief. Because some things we as people shouldn't get wrong. So just want to say that to repair anything that I say ahead that sounds off when it comes to being healthy and pursuing options we might have in front of us. But okay, let's get to it. Here's me and Brian Lane. Yeah, hello. My name is Brian Lane. I am actually in the United States. I live in the state of Indiana, <laughs> near Indianapolis. Um, hey, I am a school teacher, school administrator uh, that has Tourette syndrome. I was diagnosed when I was uh, seven years old. Been having tics since I was three. I am now a lot older than that. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> uh, been teaching for a long time, so. Um, I, I do lots of other things. I'm also a volunteer firefighter and EMT, and I also serve on the Tourette Association of America Education Advisory Board and Diversity Committee. So it's it's kind of a, a, a fortunate situation, I guess, for the Tourette Association to have access to a teacher with TS. And I've talked to a few others in the past, uh, mm -hmm. educators who have TS, and they end up being in, I, th I think, really great positions to educate just because of the sense of empathy and identity that you can have with students who are maybe having their own problems kind of keeping up and, you know, uh, all these dynamics kind of speak to each other. Um, well, first off, what, what do you teach and, and what's the classroom dynamic like? Uh, I mean, I assume your, your students know about your TS and how does all that go? Obviously, <laughs> it's kind of hard to hide <laughs> it, but uh, very good questions. Number one, I do teach uh, choir and theater. Uh, currently I'm at a middle school. I have taught everything from kindergarten through adults. Um, again, I was a school administrator, uh, at a secondary school, middle school and high mm -hmm. school for five years. And then just really missed the classroom and went back, <clears throat> went back into it. So, uh, that's, <laughs> that's where I'm at. Students obviously do know that I tick my, the, the school knows that I tick, um, I'm very upfront and honest about it with from them right from the beginning. I educate them. They learn something new. And, uh, you know, after the first week or so, we all get used to it. They learn. The funny thing is they learn what's what triggers me. And if they want to get me off on a tangent, they know what to do. <laughs> I mean, they, they kind of hold the power in the classroom, which is great. I yeah. enjoy that because then it becomes a more collaborative atmosphere. Um, but they're also very respectful. I don't want to sound like they're they're mean or, or rude. They're, they're very respectful. And... Um, Parents generally very supportive. I've I've never had a problem that I I could in the. This, I'll be starting my twenty seventh year, hopefully, according to the 
whatever the coronavirus wants mm-hmm. us to do. Uh, I'll be starting my 27th year here very soon. So uh, your students, is is TS something they know about you coming into it, or is that something you have to kind of announce on the first day, or how does that come um, together? Currently, I'm at, this will be my third year at the school I'm at, so most of the students know now. It's a two, it's a, sorry, a three-year middle school, um, so most of the students know, uh, some of them, are, and we're getting to the point where, you know, I have younger siblings that have been there for a while. Um, obviously if it's a new school and I've, I've taught several different places and several new schools. Um, but obviously they at first don't know about it and they learn about it very quickly. So that that's, but like I said, they've always been very accepting of it. I've never really had any, I mean, a lot of laughter, a lot of strange looks, especially with middle school. Cause middle school is just strange anyway, you know, that yeah. or middle, middle, I, I know it's different where you are around the world. I understand that, but, uh, it really is. I, Students are much more respectful than adults, I learned, to be honest with you, when you're out and about. Like, an example, Uh, with the COVID and the coronavirus, I have a throat throat clearing tick and a coughing tick that you're hearing as I go through here. And I have got death stares, finger points, whispering like I am Satan walking on her (laughs) with the coronavirus. And, you know, students really never, you know, I I taught online the last two or three months and it was not a problem. It's just, yeah. it, it's, it's nice. You know, we always think that the students are the, the most naive, but sometimes they're also the smartest in my opinion. <laughs> for sure. Because, you know, at, at that age, and maybe I, I can just speak for myself, but hey, hey. when I was 11, 12, 13 years old, you know, I, I definitely had a novel way of looking at a lot of things and, you know, not having too much life experience behind me. It's, it's a really amazing age to learn because you're developing personality and, and your repertoire and <laughs> I, I guess sort of your outward level of, you know, just what you want to project. And, and kind of understanding that level of acceptance at that age is something that I feel like is really potent for the years that follow. Have you kept up with any any of your your past students or anything like that? Actually, yes. Uh, it's ironic you bring that up. I just recently played golf with one of my. I'm a golfer, and just played golf with one of my former students. He's now well into his thirties, <laughs> but uh, uh, he was. I coached him in golf and then taught him in school for you know, mo- several years, probably from, uh, yeah, seventh grade on mm. through his high school years at the school <clears throat> I was at, I taught all the way up and, um, we play golf regularly and have a good time. So yeah, I, I stay in contact with several of my former students. So, uh, hey. the theater and, and choir, hey. is that something that kind of, I, I imagine that's something that started in your youth. I mean, there's, and I asked that kind of with, uh, in the context of, uh, creativity and arts and all that kind of really overlapping heavily with uh, the TS crowd? Yeah, it's it's a very interesting question. And uh, right before earlier today, I actually did a, a, present, a virtual presentation <clears throat> for um, the Trade Association of America, Wisconsin group was doing a, uh, a webinar and I did, you know, talking about schools and working together with schools as parents and students with TS. And, you know, I brought up that <clears throat> most of us who have the Tourette usually excel somewhere in the arts Mm -hmm. area, um, whether it be visual or performing or, uh, you know, any of those kind of arts area, artsy type areas. And for me, uh, it definitely was something I, that I connected with very young. I started taking piano lessons when I was five and started voice lessons when I was in sixth Mm -hmm. grade and organ lessons also when I was in five, when I was five years old. And those are my three major instruments, uh, voice being my primary instrument. Um, and then acting, as well um and directing <laughs> and like most people when i perform i don't tick it's just uh, hmm. that that intense intense focus and that uh um using that part of my brain kind of shuts down the ticks for a while which is always nice so i i love performing it, it's, it's interesting uh the, the people I've talked to over the years who who had the same story, whether it's, you know, a musical instrument or or they're doing some sort of visual <clears throat> art, kind of just getting into the zone of it, it is a vacation from their tics. And sometimes it really encourages them to pursue that just because of the escape and, and the level of peace that you get when you're doing something that, A, you're good at, you know, you can develop a sense of confidence uh, in, in having a skill that people may take note of, but B, also just the break you get from... The, the, the pressure to tick, the pressure you put on yourself and, or that pressure hey. you feel, um, hey, you. Did, did, did that kind of influence you to, to want to go in that direction just because of the sense of grace you get? Absolutely. There's little, yeah, little doubt that that did. And that it's interesting because nobody in my family that I know of, and I didn't grow up in a very good home. That could be another podcast another hmm. day, but, um, 
I didn't grow in a very good home and music was my release and connection for yeah. everything. And no one in my family is musical. No one can act. Huh. Uh, but it, it really, it really did take with me. And, uh, it, like you just said, it, it provided that, that break from time to time that was sorely needed <laughs> and still is even in, in my, in my forties here, it's, it's still a time when I sorely mm-hmm. need it. So, Hey, one thing I can remember with myself, I did a lot of uh, drawing and painting when I was young, you know, when I was maybe 10 and to, uh, you know, definitely into my early 20s. And then I kind of picked up some other kinds of arts from that point. But a lot of it, the skill Please. development was kind of, I guess, attributed to the self-isolating that I would do with myself. And, you know, just just kind of mm-hmm. either to get away from uh, the the sort of social nervousness that I had or just to experience that joy of just kind of like I'm creating something and this is something I can be proud of. But that isolation was really good practice time for me to develop that skill. Is that something you can relate to? Absolutely. And I don't even know if you heard and you may have thought it was a tick, but I did chuckle when you were saying that (laughs) because it certainly brought back tons of fond memories of, you know, shutting myself in my own bedroom and doing my thing and that isolation, just that oneness that you get with yourself and that peace and that calmness of just kind of being, uh, on your own and in your own world. Um, and it's hard to explain that to someone that doesn't have Tourette's. Yeah. Uh, that's why, again, I, I chuckle when you say it because you, you get it, you understand what I'm saying. And, um, a lot of times when I, when I talk with parents who, ha- who don't understand their children are trying to figure them out, you know, they'll say, well, my child likes to go off and kind of be by themselves. And I'm like, yes, because that's the time they feel free and feel right. normal. And so what, you know, and parents are always concerned, well, is that a bad thing? I'm like, no, they're just, they're, they're realizing they're learning about themselves. And it's so important. That's such a large, in my opinion, a large part of growing up with yeah. Tourette is internalizing it and figuring out what works for you and what doesn't work. Uh, so you can be successful. I'm a firm believer that anybody can be successful in 98% of the jobs out there. Um, no, I probably wouldn't want to be a surgeon, but mm-hmm. uh, there's no reason I couldn't be a doctor, yeah. you know? Uh, so <clears throat> that's just the way I've always felt. And uh, I, if you looked at my resume, I've done a ton of different things over, over my life, over my adult life. And it's just because I always said to myself as a younger person growing up in that isolation type setting, I was never going to let this stop me. And I was always going to accept any challenge and try it. If I failed, that's fine. But at least I tried it. <clears throat> that's a really good point, uh, especially I, I think for the parents listening who might have that same question in their minds hey. that, you know, my, my, my child is really isolating or, or self-isolating. I feel like this might be unhealthy. Shouldn't he be out socializing? Or shouldn't he or she be out socializing? And I mean, sure, but uh, it, it is important because kind of having that time to kind of cultivate who you are and see yourself on your own terms versus on somebody else's terms when you're in a social setting it really is important time to figure out how to love yourself in a way. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, to kind of add to that, you know, a lot, and I get that a lot from parents, like I explained to you and the way I try to say it, uh, make sure they understand that, you know, I, I, I don't know your specific need of your child. You know, maybe the self-isolation is a mm-hmm. problem, but I also always point out <clears throat> that unlike most, I, I hate to use the word disability is one of my least favorite mm-hmm. words in the world. One of the differences in our worlds are, Tourette is so different from case to case and individual to individual that, you know, you've got to know your child. You've got to let your child be your child. And I always tell them nobody knows what's going on with the child more than the child and him or herself. So I really always encourage parents just to just to love them through that individualism and love them through that that solace and that peace. And if there's a problem, talk to them. Just make sure you always have a good relationship with them and they'll, they'll feel more comfortable to come to you and say, look, I need some help or whatever. So. Yeah. And, and, and th- that's a, a huge piece too, just being there to say things are okay and, and just kind of be just a kind of a, a mattress of support for your kid. And, and, you know, you're not being neglectful. You're not, you know, it's just if, if, if you're there as a friend and as a supporter and, and you get it and you give them the space to kind of breathe and, and be the person that they need to be in the moment. That's, I, I think, probably important for any child, but uh, definitely in the TS context. And, and you had mentioned, and you know, we don't have to go there if you don't want to. But you mentioned kind of having a a, a tough childhood. You know, uh, how did you? But because I hear from a lot of people who were who don't have parental support or have a, a maybe just a sense of misunderstanding in the household, and it does affect their development and their confidence in themselves and what they think is possible for them because they don't necessarily, even in their home court, 
have fandom. How did you kind of get through that to, to develop that sense of confidence? I mean, was it the isolation time and kind of cultivating your skills or, or what, what do you think about that? Yeah, that's a great question, the way you presented it. And I've, I've done, I shared with you just a few minutes ago, I've done several interviews and, and it's never been quite asked like that. And I really like the way you ask it. Um, yeah, I grew up in a struggle of a home. Um, the, obviously, the self-isolation really did help. I did not have parental support at all for most of my life um, or any of my life. I, I say most because once I turned... When I got to a certain age, I was out. Hmm. So uh, I, I really don't have a good relationship with my parents. Don't speak with them. Um, matter of fact, my father passed away and I didn't even know about it till long after. Hmm. So it's like, again, another story, another day. But um, it was in those self-isolation times and those reflective times when I decided that I was going to overcome what ah, the expectation of me was. And that was to be pretty much a loser in life. And that's when I, I, you know, just in my own mind, I, I became strong and knew that I wasn't going to let things stand in my way and that no matter what curveball was thrown my way, I would do my best to either duck it, catch it, and throw it back or hit it out yeah. of the park. And that's, that's just my best advice for, for young people who live in that kind of environment, you know. Um, learn from that tough environment. Don't let it consume you. That's important to just kind of have it as a statement of fact that, you know, it, it is possible for me to hey. succeed and get where I want to be and to not let this stuff clawing at me get the best of me. And maybe it is, it is easier said than done, but, but, but it is important to recognize that it can be a true statement of fact and you can pursue it again, you know, easier said than done, but it, it's, it's possible. And it's, it's important to hear from people like you who've you know, you've gone through it and you're successful and you are where you are and you're able to kind of help other people who, that, that's why I think it's so great. I was saying before that it's so great that you're a teacher having that background because so many other kids, you know, confidence in the classroom is a huge thing. And, you know, not everybody wants to sit at the front and participate and, you know, there can be a huge level of self-consciousness. And uh, I, I imagine that you would have a way of relating to to kids like that, you know, TS or not, you know, no, ma no matter what their background is, a teacher with TS has that kind of unique skill. Hey. And I agree a hundred percent. And that's, I, I will tell you, there's, there's no question. That's why I went into teaching uh, was because of how, or what I went through as a youngster and how I was raised or actually not raised, <laughs> I should say properly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, and I, I, I'm a firm believer that because of the way I am and the, you know, the, my background, um, you know, my goal every day is to get up and go into school. And if, if I, if I make a difference in one life, I've succeeded. And if I can do that every day, that's, you know, in America where we, where I teach it's, it's 185 chances and opportunities to make a difference in someone's life. And that's, that's the way I look yeah. at it. And then you start compounding that over the years and it becomes thousands upon thousands of, of opportunities you have or I have as a teacher to to affect change in someone's life and to let them know they're going to be okay no matter what they've come from. And that's why I've chosen, I mean, I work on the, uh, I work at an inner city school in, on the east side of Annapolis, which, which is not one of your top 10 neighborhoods in, in the country, mm -hmm. but um, I work with some, some troubled youth and that's, that's always been my passion because I know they need the most love. <clears throat> <clears throat> have you run across students who have TS? Yes. Interesting question. I wonder if that's going to come <laughs> up. Uh, it usually does. The first time it happened, I was very young in my career. And I can tell you, I was, I was scared to death. I mean, you could have, I, I mean, I thought, should I pack up my, my desk now and quit? Because what am I going to do when this parent, this kid goes home and tells them parents, I'm making fun of them by the movements that I'm making, uh. because <clears throat> as you know, ticks are highly suggestive. Yeah. And so <laughs> when you get a couple of treaders in a room, they kind of, feet off of each <laughs> other right. and I, it, it, it definitely happened. And thankfully, uh, I, I, I had the better end of the stick and the student actually came to me and we actually kind of actually it was about the same time. I was just thinking, I've got to go talk to this parent. I've got to go talk to this student and let him know, look, I'm not, but he actually came to me and he did not know that he had to yeah. <clears throat> But uh, he knew that I did things like him, and he couldn't figure that out. Why? Wow. And it was probably, I would say, in, and I, I figured it out one day, especially with the classes I teach. I, I get, you know, larger classes. I have taught almost 10,000 students over the years. And I will say that experience happened 
would have to be top one, two, or three in my teaching career so wow. far. Uh, because I knew at that point I was going to be okay as a teacher. When I had a student whose parents worked with me, um, and this student ended up getting a diagnosis of Tourette's just because I ticked in a classroom. Wow. I knew I knew my job was going to be all right. And I knew my life was my life choice for a career was going to be all right. That's amazing. So, yeah. So, and yes, yeah, so over the years, then I've had two or three, four. Uh, I, when I, and I taught in Florida for a while. And for some reason, I had like four in one year. It was amazing. And, you know, we, we kind of had our own little club. It was neat. We would eat lunch <laughs> together. We would, we, you know, we had a good time. Uh, parents, I met with a lot of the parents. It was, it was just a lot of fun that year. So it's, it's rare, <laughs> but it does happen. And, uh, it's great because then those kids come into a place where they feel okay for at least a few minutes in the day. That's amazing. Are you ever in the position where you know, the, the question comes up a lot, you know, with parents of uh, <laughs> how do I advocate for my son or daughter at school? Um, you know, th- there are the individualized education plans and so on. And it's, it's not as easy as just saying <laughs> to the, to the, the central office, you know, I, uh, my son has TS, you know, we need the accommodations. Uh, it's people can be denied. And pe- I mean, d- have you ever had to walk people through that process or uh, is that something you advocate for or? Yes, very often. Um, in fact, that's what most of my conference or my virtual conference earlier today was about. Um, I do that all the time. I've gone all over the country called, you know, set in on conferences all across the country as part of the Tourette Association Advisory, Educational Advisory Board. Um Yes, I definitely advise and talk with parents and schools uh, because it's tough. And, you know, the, one of the things that I always stress is it's got to be a proactive approach rather than a reactive right. approach. If you, if you get to the point where the school's calling you or you're calling the school when there's problems, it's too late. You've got to deal with those. We've got to deal with these, these, these strengths that these, ch- these children have at the beginning and build those relationships so that if a problem arises, we've already got a proactive approach to it um, because giving consequences and punishment is going to do nothing except bring the child down. Giving them resources and positives uh, will help build that child up. And I, I am a firm believer that the child should be a part of that educational conference because no one knows what's going on with that child, even mom or dad or whoever the caregiver is, more than the child does. <clears throat> So I am a huge proponent. And I've actually had schools tell me, no, we can't bring Susie out of class. She's in third grade. And I said, no, Susie needs to be in here. Even if she doesn't understand the big words or Tommy doesn't understand the big words, when you have a question on what, what helps Susie or Tommy, they're the best right. people to ask because they know. And so that's, that's something I've always advocated for. So do, do you follow outcomes? Yeah, I do. And I, I will often do that. I'll often follow up after I've had that initial meeting. First of all, I'll meet with the parents usually and the child. Uh, and then we'll go to the meeting together, either by phone or in person. I've done both. And then I will ask, you know, because I always give advice to to schools and to parents to make sure that that communication stays in effect, not just that, that at the annual case conference, but, you know, on a monthly at the very least basis, because, you know, Tourette is ever changing and schools need to know what's going on at home. Home needs to know what's going on at school. It's got to be a team. And the way I always phrase it is the, the, the youngster with the, the Tourette and the, and the parent of the coaches and the, the school is the team. And we've got to work together uh, to get our team across the, the goal line to win the game. And so I will always follow up. Usually I usually do it about every two to three months throughout that school year, just to make mm-hmm. sure everybody's still on track. And if there's anything I can do to support them, uh, cause I want them to understand that it's not just here. I'm going to come in and say, say hello, and then get you on your right track and let you go because that's what happens so often. I want them to know how important that communication is. So that's something I do. So, uh, w- with, with your own TS experience, <clears throat> is it something that, uh, hey, you know, t- ticks can kind of fluctuate, come and go over the years. There, there's obviously the, also the, the piece we hear so often that, you know, when you grow up, your ticks are going to grow, are going to go away and you <laughs> obviously still have ticks yeah. in your, uh, in your adulthood, in your forties, um, <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing how doctors always get that wrong, isn't it? So, <laughs> um, but yeah, how's that? Uh, what's the trajectory been like for you? Uh, good question. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here to tell you, and that's something that, that I know is a, a mind shift, even with the Trade Association that I'm working with now. Um, it's always been geared toward the youth. And I'm, I'm happy to say under the leadership that we have now in the Trade Association of America, she's doing a great job. Of bringing, Amanda's awesome. Yeah, bringing people, you know, into the fold that understand that adults still have it too. Um, 
in defense of those doctors who who don't know any better, and I'm not trying to put any doctors down at all. I would never do that, <laughs> but they're the experts, and they're just going what they're just telling people what they've been trained to tell them. Um, right. My ticks did get a lot better once I got out of college, or once I got into college, out of high school, <clears throat> and then somewhere around mid 20s late 20s right after i started teaching <clears throat> everything started to seem to come back again pretty strong and has been there pretty much ever since then <clears throat> what do you think that is i mean th- there's a lot of uh you, you hear from a lot of teens you know when they go from like middle school to high school and so on you know it seems to be these like turnstiles where you know your ticks are going to flare up when you have these big transition moments in your life uh what wh- has that been the case for you or what wh- what do you like sure. Yeah. Anytime you have any kind of high stress or high emotional moments or, you know, activities, that obviously is when it's going to be better. But to answer your very first question, if I knew that answer, I would be a millionaire sitting somewhere on a beach <laughs> doing life. But um, I don't know the reason why it does that. But that's, that's, I almost, I'm going to say it, that's the glory of Tourette. It's just ever changing. And mm-hmm. uh, uh, it also can be the the beast of Tourette as well, because you're just not sure from time to time what's going to change, what's going to happen. But, <clears throat> but I, you know, I people always say, doesn't it bother you? Doesn't it bother you? Sure, I have bad days. We all do. But people who don't have Tourette have bad days too. It's just mm-hmm. that, you know, after all these years, you learn to live with it. You learn to, to adjust and adapt and make sure that your life is still a fulfilling life, um, <clears throat> regardless of what, deck of cards you've been handed there you know what i'm saying <clears throat> we'll be right back the Tourette association of america is the premier nonprofit working to raise awareness advance research and provide ongoing support to those with Tourette syndrome or tick disorder with a network of over 130 chapters support groups and centers of excellence the taa engages with communities across the nation in an effort to provide tools, webinars, workshops, and support for all seeking assistance. As a primary sponsor of Tourette's podcast, the TAA supports the authentic conversations showcasing the diverse representation of the TS community. To learn more, visit Tourette.org. T-O-U-R-E-T-T-E dot org. You, you had mentioned also before we started recording that... Uh you know, sleep is a challenge and that's a familiar story to, you know, probably most of the people listening. Energy is an issue with me. Even if I, sometimes I'll take trazodone to try to help me sleep and try to practice, I guess, what they call good sleep hygiene. And I think I addressed this a few episodes ago, just kind of like ritualistic things I do to try to, you know, tame my brain at nighttime. How do you do with that? Yeah, I don't. I'm not going to lie. That is probably my <laughs> biggest weakness. I, I and I did share with you. I really struggle with sleep patterns and sleep cycles. And you know, I, people are amazed when I I'm about to make the next statement that I'm going to make here that I'm I, I'm okay and I can survive. But I truly survive on two to three hours of sleep at night if I'm mm-hmm. lucky. Or um, when they're like, "Well, that's not healthy." That's not. I'm like, "You're right. It's not healthy for you." But it is the way I've grown accustomed to. Um, I have tried all those medicines. I tried melatonin forever and it was great for a little while, but just like any mm-hmm. medication, in my opinion, for Tourette, because there is no medication just for Tourette, once your body gets used to it, you either move on to the next medication or you just move on. And for me, it was move on. Like I said, the melatonin were great for a little while and then my body got used to it mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I went right back to struggling to sleep. Um, I do use from time to time, especially if I don't have anything going on the next day, like the z type stuff, not to... Yeah give any name brand products here, but the sleep liquid or the sleep pills. Um, and yeah, they'll get me, um, some days I can get five hours of sleep if I'm lucky, but, uh, when I do that, but then the problem is for me, at least the next, the, at least the first five to six hours of the next day, I'm barely alive. It feels like. So yeah, I try not to do that too much. And I, 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 so sleep has always been a problem. It really has. And I know that's a, that is a very common issue. Um, and it's interesting you bring it up because one of the first questions I ask parents when they when they talk about or the teachers talk about, um, well, Johnny comes in here really just tired and wants to sleep all the time. And, you know, one of my first questions always is, well, what is the sleep like at home? And then the teachers start realizing, oh, well, yeah, the kid was up all night trying to get to sleep to tick. And now you got to get him up at five o'clock in the morning to get him on the bus for an hour ride at six o'clock. You know, mm-hmm. then you understand why Johnny is sleeping in the class and. 
So it, it is an issue. Sleep has always been an issue with those of us who have Tourette, I think, for the most part. Some aren't affected, but some are really affected. And I'm definitely one of those that are really affected. I just yeah, love to it, deal with basically. It, it, it's funny what you were saying about it's generally unhealthy to, to go on, you know, two to three hours a night, two to three, four. But it is sort of this um, unfortunate superpower or because uh, I'm the same way. I, I get about four hours a night. And, yeah, I think that's probably a good word. That's probably a good word. Superpower is probably right. Yeah. Because I, people always ask, you know, well, you know, it's not healthy. And I always say, hey, I go get a physical every year. I'm happy to share that with you. I don't have anything to hide. <laughs> if you'd like to see that I am healthy and normal and ready to roll, then I'm happy to share it. But yeah, again, it's, it's just an individual thing. That's, that's how my body has adjusted. Much like I would say, and I, this is maybe a horrible analogy, but for the individual who has been in a wheelchair their whole life, uh-huh. uh, it's just it's, it's the normal for them. They, they, they don't, I guess they don't think about what it's like to get up and walk around, you know, just that's all they've ever known. And that's kind of the way I am. <clears throat> There is that, because uh, it's, it's, it's been yeah. lifelong for me. I'm, I'm 40 years old and it's, you know, ever since I can remember, ever yeah. since my parents can remember, just, you know, sleep in me, we're not happening. Yeah. Occasionally something breaks and there'll be the odd weekend where I end up sleeping, you know, from like, say, maybe 1 a.m. the, the you know, that morning into like 3 p.m. that 3 day. the next morning. Yeah, I have got to say, yeah. sleep, like 12 to 4. Yep, I, I understand that pattern. It's, it's, it's so weird and it's... It, it has been a lifelong thing where I, I, my vitals are good. I, same, same thing. I get a physical every year. Uh, I seem to be doing okay. My alertness is, is pretty good, I guess. Cognitive abilities, I guess, pretty good. But I, I don't really know the, the life of, uh, of a healthy amount of sleep. And I was doing a lot of reading a little while back on just the, the stakes of a, of a healthy <coughs> night of sleep. And, you know, it, it was, uh, this was for a general audience, you know, just kind of the everyday person, so to hey. speak. And, and yeah, th- there are consequences to, to not sleeping, but what I was reading and the sort of, you know, if you don't sleep, here's what you can expect. And none of these things were really bearing out for me. I was, <laughs> uh, th- th- there was a, there was a passage of something I was reading that there was a small percentage of people who can legitimately kind of get away with just a few hours a night and everybody ends up responding, Oh, well, that must be me. Cause I, I never sleep, but I really do feel like that's me. <laughs> I agree. I'm right there with you. And I, I, you know, for me, I think it's because this is the way it's always been my brain. And I think, you know, I, I still think our brain is one of the most amazing things ever created no, by so whoever you believe is the creator or whatever you believe is the creator. I, I think we still have never tapped into what the brain can really do. And I think, our, I think it's just adapted to our bodies to say, this is what I'm going to function on. And this is all you need. And we're going to be okay. And that's just how I believe. So. Again, no doctor, no, no way to prove that. That's just my own belief. <clears throat> right, yeah. And, and I guess for the people listening, you know, don't, don't uh, just stop sleeping because we're talking about this the way we are. But uh, Absolutely, absolutely. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not telling, you, telling you about not to sleep. I, I'll, I'll buy that too. <clears throat> so the, the comorbids that go along with TS, you know, the depression, anxiety, OCD, things like that, uh, do any of that overlap with you? Of course. Um, OCD, yeah. Uh, the number I've seen that I use in my presentations, because that's what the research says, is 85% at least have OCD. I, I would venture to say the number is higher. And I'm not a big fan of the word OCD when it comes to Tourette. Um, right. I know that's the official diagnosis, but <clears throat> I, I would definitely, I use the term and I, I encourage the term Tourette OCD um, because it's a, it's a special form of OCD. You know, I, right. don't, I don't go wash my hands all the time. I don't. Uh, turn light switches on and off, but all of, you know, my ticks are all very influenced by the OCD side. And that is, that's where I kind of get the whole, the teretic OCD as opposed to the pure OCD that many people talk about. And, you know, one of my biggest pet peeves is hearing, oh, that's just my OCD, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, whatever. You don't understand, but that's all right. So, <laughs> but yeah, I have OCD, ADD, ADHD, um, anxiety, um, major depression issues, uh, intrusive thoughts, which is kind of part of the OCD, um, sensory, some several sensory issues. And that's, yeah. that's just about enough for me for a while. So, <laughs> so have you over the years tried to, you, you mentioned medications and it's like, you know, we're talking in the context of sleep and, you know, kind of when you're Tourette, it's almost like your Tourette figures out what you're trying to do. And it's like, not so fast. We're done with this stuff. I'm not going to cooperate anymore. I'm going to be awake. Yeah, have have you had a similar experience with that medicating other aspects of this, uh, Tourette OCD or anything else? Absolutely, and I, I think that's I, I think that's true more than just Tourette. I mean, I think we 
and I can't speak for the rest of the world, but, uh, you know, the United States is let's give medicine for everything. Yeah. But, uh, you know, my thing is, um, like anything, it's like I said before, there, first of all, there's no medication specifically for Tourette. Everything that's prescribed for Tourette is actually, was actually created for some other problem. Right. And, um, you know, after you take it for a year, year and a half, your body is used to that. It's, it's, and I don't, I don't want to use the, my God, this is a terrible example and, and you may want to edit this out, but uh, <laughs> it's like a drug user. You know, it, you, you start yeah. on a drug and your body gets used to that drug and your drug wants the next one or your body wants the next one, a little bigger, a little better, a little harder. And you end up becoming a drug addict. And, um, I don't say, please don't, don't think I'm saying that threat people are drug addicts. What I'm saying is, <laughs> uh, our bodies get used to that, whatever it may be. And it's, mm-hmm. it's just funny. Everybody I've talked to, it's just the same list. That Well, we started, the doctor started us here, then we went to here, then we went to here. I'm like, yeah, I can give you the exact same list that started with me 20 years ago when I did this. Yeah. So, um, But there again, we go back to what doctors are trained to do and what they're told to do, and they're doing the best they can. It's just the problem is there's nothing created just for this, and, and it's unfortunate. Um, you know, once your body gets used to it, you move on to something else, or you just don't do it. And for me, I had gone through the entire pharmacy, uh, um, I have yet to hear a drug from a parent or <clears throat> someone who is working with the that I have not tried. Um, but I have not been on medication for about 15, 18 years, I guess it is now. <clears throat> right. Just because yeah, I, I got tired of it. You get the, the, Cause the side effects are awful. Anybody that's on threat medication will tell you the side effects are awful. Yeah, I've I've been on the <clears throat> haloperidol and anaphronil and all that stuff, sure. and we, we probably have the same list. But yeah, I'm sure we do. Everybody <laughs> does. <laughs> so, are, are there other places that um, you try to go in your mind to, I guess, kind of cultivate some kind of break from it? Uh, you know, I, I've for me recently, I always thought meditation and yoga and stuff like that would be a total non-starter with me, just because of the nature of Tourette and ADHD and and just inability to kind of focus on any one thing or clear my mind, but somehow I've, I've also kind of found a, a pathway into that to where it is actually kind of doing me some good. It doesn't always work, but when it does, it's, it's actually pretty impactful to me. Um, are, are there any, do you have anything else that you kind of go to besides the, the act of, uh, uh, arts or anything else that yeah, seems to kind of give you a break? Much like you, um, very skeptical, of course, first of all, anyway, so I've always been a very skeptical person. Um, trust is a huge issue with me. I don't, I don't trust anyone. I don't trust anything. Um, me too. I, I, Skeptical is, is such a perfect word. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, for me, I know it's, it's just me as a person, but it also goes back to the way I was, where it was raised, um, in a rough home. I, I never, I learned early on not to trust my parents. So if I can't trust them, I can't trust anybody. But, hmm. um, you know, my thing is, uh, what I've learned, i and this has only been in the last Oh, I would say 10 to about the time I stopped the medication, 10 to 15 years. I thought, okay, I've got to try to find some other ways that might help. And, you know, I was one of those people who grew up and said chiropractors were a joke. They were the worst things in the world, but I love my chiropractor. I wouldn't, you know, I would, I will <laughs> freely get down on hand and knee and tell you that I was wrong at putting down chiropractors. I love mine. He does help. It helps so much with different things just to loosen up those tight muscles and joints yeah. that <clears throat> are constantly um, destroyed by, by ticking. And, um, um, about five years ago, I found a massage therapist because I had my chiropractor suggested, I'm like, all right, whatever. I'm not gonna go pay somebody else. Best thing I ever did. Those, those in combination are awesome. Just that, that moment of relaxation. And like you said, that Zen moment that you get And you know, mm-hmm. I'm a big calm fan. And it, for me, like during the, the, the lockdown and quarantine here, um, some things that have helped me because that this actually came up early on. I did a, a, a YouTube podcast type video cast, I guess, whatever I'm trying to say there um, mm-hmm. early on about things that might help journaling. I've, I've gotten into journaling. I, I write something down every day about, you know, what's yeah. going well, and it's just that moment of reflection. And mm-hmm. I use <clears throat> calm.com. I'm again, not trying to advertise for anybody, but I use that <laughs> app a lot. Um, just the moments of just, sitting and quietly trying to meditate are, are amazing and have helped a lot, even more so than the medication. It's a lot cheaper. It's a lot better for my body. That's the way I look at it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. You, you mentioned journaling. That's, that's kind of a recent discovery for me. I, I've always um, been a writer, I guess. I mean, that, that was my career for a long time was, was journalism. <laughs> um, 
but but journaling is a is a kind of a different thing altogether, a different approach. And uh, I just recently, I mean, it's just funny you mentioned this. Um, within the past maybe three weeks, I have been Thanks. starting my day just kind of writing out kind of my intentions of kind of here's what I knew I got coming up, here's what I need to keep in mind, here's where I am, you know, here's how I slept, you know, just kind of anything I can think of at the moment. And it just kind of incidentally <laughs> adds, it's a calming thing to do and kind of sets out an intention for the day. Um, but I, I guess in that, it also kind of gives me some structure that I otherwise didn't have. I, I would say generally, I kind of live in a very chaotic way right. where I don't write things down. I just, you know, when it's time to get to them, I, um, like for example, this, this podcast interview, I, right. I, I didn't have it on a planner or anything like that. I was just like, I knew vaguely, like sometime Wednesday, I got to talk to Brian. And so I went into my Instagram and I looked at our messages when we talked. I'm like, okay, we're going to talk at seven. And uh, so I, I just kind of live very, very loosely and chaotically. And that's always kind of worked out for me. I don't alphabetize my books, you know, uh, to say it another way. But kind of adding this structure has also kind of taken a load off my brain in kind of always kind of wondering what's next, if that makes sense. It and does wholeheartedly. It's really helped. You know, I'm a, I am the opposite. I'm a list maker. I have, I have, I have dry erase boards and, and notes and stuff hanging everywhere, you know, for me, that's, that's how I try to stay organized. But like you said, and this, this came, it was actually a suggestion. I, I think I read it. Um, it had nothing to do with Tourette about, you know, you're stuck in this, this quarantine situation, what might help. And I, I it was, like I said, it was just a random article, I, probably on Yahoo that I read. And um, one of the suggestions was journaling. And I am telling you, even if we come out of this ever at some point, uh, hmm. I will continue this because it has been very helpful to be reflective. And I'm the opposite. I do it at the end of the day to reflect on what I've done and what goals I want to establish for the next day. But yeah, it's amazing. It's, and I am, I am terrible. I have a terrible handwriting. I, you know, it's a very <laughs> common threat thing. I hate to write because of the ticks, but the focus I'm learning, the more I do it, the more I focus, the better my ticks are. It's just like acting, singing, playing, you know, you name it. So it's interesting. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, um, something easing about it. And, and I think it's almost like, I feel like I'm taking care of taking better care of myself or there's some sort of like system in place that is taking care of me just because I'm making this intentional effort to express. And that, I mean, so I, I, there was a period of time where I was a list maker and, uh, I had the, the dry weight I have this like smart board on my wall and you yeah. know, I would, uh, I think the first season of the podcast, I had everything kind of laid out and it was all very sort of corporate level, just very tidy. And I, I, I'm really bad at keeping habits or, or keeping good habits. They just kind of fall away because somehow I think my brain is just like, you don't need to do that. You know, right. I, I just kind of hacked myself back into uh, this, this sense of chaos that I guess has always kind of worked for me in the same way that I, you know, have survived so long and very little sleep. But there is something I think, you know, I just turned 40 back in June and that, that kind of feels like a, like a mile marker. And uh, I remember that day. It was, it was definitely a mile marker. I could yeah. <laughs> and it, it just kind of feels different now. And I feel a little bit more woken up. And I, I know a lot of that is just kind, kind of the brain game or the the sort of baggage of, um, you know, how being, how turning 40 is, is historically been characterized, but, but it does kind of add, I do feel this extra sense of urgency to kind of get my stuff together. Yep. Yeah. And this is one where I, I feel like it's, it is going to have some sense of permanence, just kind of journaling. And I, I don't necessarily have any sort of systematic hang of it. It really is just kind of waking up. The book is right there. My handwriting used to be good once upon a time. <laughs> it's, it's, it's garbage now, but uh, I, I blame journalism for that. But there you go. But there you go. Th there's just something about the act of it and just kind of like getting out my thoughts and, and, <laughs> You know, I'm I'm not I'm not writing it for any outside audience. So no, and that's the thing. Who cares what you write? You know. Yeah, and and so it's the first instinct ends up. You know, I'm writing by feel, and there's just something really kind of meditative and therapeutic about that process. Uh, I, I agree wholeheartedly. And you know, er, when I, when I started talking about this early on in that that very first, like I said, video log or vlog, whatever it's called, you know, what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mentioned was one of the questions that came up while we were doing it was. Well, how, how young should we do? And I, my, my initial thought is when your child can put together a thought and put it down on a piece of paper, I think that would be the best time to do it. And you may have to help them at first, sure, but get them in that habit. Man, oh man, like I said, the, the ther like you said, the therapeutic uh, aspects of it are, are mind-boggling now that I'm a few months into it. 
So you, you mentioned uh, chiropractic as well, and yeah, that that, that is a, a divisive thing. You know, is it, is it is it real? Is it you know is it snake oil or whatever? And and I was uh, there's... I was in that bandwagon for most of my life. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> <clears throat> is, is there something about the the sort of you know the, the name of the game is I guess you could say <laughs> when you use wellness in the context of chiropractic, it kind of takes on a different kind of meaning, and and sometimes just relaxation and just kind of walking out feeling better because of something that was done. Uh, th- there is something different about that than, you know, being <clears throat> prescribed something that's supposed to make you feel better at some point. Right. Uh, w- w- what do you, what do you think it is about, you mentioned massage as well. I, I hear people talk <clears throat> about acupuncture and same thing, you know, scientifically the jury may be out on it, but I go down the, the acupuncture road, but I don't like things sticking in me if I can avoid it. So that's always been my thing on the acupuncture, <laughs> but it, you know, and you. my thing on the chiropractor. And this is what I learned when I actually started doing it. Cause I, before I do something, especially something I'm totally dead set against and very skeptical against, I'm going to do all the research I can. <clears throat> That's just the way I've always been. Um, and I found that I've got to find a chi- I found a chiropractor who practices this, this practices the kind of this Zen chiropractic, and you know it is more of a meditative practice. And the same thing with the mas- massage therapist. I can't just go to any chiropractor. I can't just go to any massage therapist and get it done. It's got to be people who, in my opinion, set that calming mood so much more and that is what makes that's that's what made me buy into it i thought all right i'm gonna go to this because i think it might help with what i do <clears throat> and actually my chiropractor now treats four of us who have to ride around the area because oh, wow. uh, i recommended it right away and so it works for me that's the way i look at it and that's the way again anything with threat whatever works for you in your individual case is what you've got to run with so. Yeah, I know it, it's it, it's such a mysterious uh, you know disorder if you want to use that word, and it, it's um, but I, I think because of the mysterious nature of it, and there are people who write into the show and they'll tell me about something that that they did, you know, that they, you know, I changed my diet to do this, and and my ticks went away, or my ticks are greatly reduced, and and it, it's. <laughs> I guess instead of questioning, you know, like, well, is that coral is, you know, the, the whole correlation is not causation thing, but um, I, I, it's, I don't really need to question it. <laughs> if it is working for them and it is getting them to a better place of happiness, then, you know, that, that's, that, that's really all I care about. And I, I think that a lot about things I do with myself where it's like, if it is placebo, I'll stretch that out as far as, as, as I can take it. Because, <laughs> you know, if it seems to be working, if I seem to be just more happy in the moment, that's what I care about more. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily turn it into me, you know, advising other people like this worked for me. So it's going to work for you, but which is what you get a lot. I mean, you get a lot of those questions, you know, yeah. why, what, what help, help me make my child control their tick or help me. I'm like, I can't, I can give you what works for me. I can refer you to someone else who has it, what works for them. But yeah, that's unfortunately part of the mystery that you've got to, we've got to figure out on our own, but I'm sorry to mean right. that. Yeah, it, it is a very individualized thing, and I, I will say the if there is a universal, it's it's so far from what I've seen. Even though you know we we talked about isolation and and the sort of like hidden power of that, you know, kind of having community on the outside too that you can relate to and that you can, or we you and I can have this conversation the way we're having it with all without all kinds of prerequisite stuff. You know, we can just kind of talk. I'm sure we could also talk about anything else we wanted to without having to kind of apologize to each other for our ticks or fill in the blanks about things, or we're not necessarily a mystery to each other, but right. yeah, just, just having that sense of community and having that sense of support. And uh, I really applaud you for, um, for being there and the, uh, the, the educator role, but also kind of helping other people through uh, advocating for themselves and, and getting what they need uh, so they can be successful in the educational environment. That's, that's <clears throat> awesome. I'm really glad you have the role that you have with TAA as well. Thank you. And I, I, I'm very happy. It, it took me a while to get to that point, uh, especially with the TAA, because I struggled for a long time with the vision and the mission and the way things were going. And I, I really didn't want to be a part of it. And then some new people got into some positions and I saw, I saw the writing on the wall, you know, so to speak. And I knew I wanted to be a part of the fun and exciting things that were taking place and changes that were taking place. And I, I see them even getting better down the road. Um, it's amazing how many positive changes have happened over just the last few years. Uh, I'm sorry that COVID kind of brought it all to a crashing or not say crashing mm-hmm. halt, but, uh, definitely a slowdown, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. But I think once we get past this, it's, it, you're going to see it even get more exciting and more user-friendly and more 
more available to everyone who needs it. And I think that's awesome. And I, I'm very, very honored and humbled to be a very, very small part of that. Hey, <laughs> is there anything I haven't asked about that is important to this context or uh, any aspects of your life that <clears throat> you think are important to your personal story that, that kind of wrap up in this some way? No, I think I've, I think you've done a great job of asking. I think I've tried to share as much as I can. And as I always tell everybody, if I think of something later or you think of something, you can feel free to reach out to me at any time. I am, like you said, I am on Instagram. Um, my Instagram is tickboy707. You can get contact me through there. I, I'm happy to give you my email, but that, I don't give too much out here on, on here. But uh, I am very, very user-friendly and very interactive with those in the Tourette community, whether it's here or whether you're uh, halfway around the world or in the middle of nowhere. I'm, I will do everything I can. If I don't, and if I don't know the answer, I'll find the person who does know the answer for you. So, uh, cause I know how important that support system can be. And, you know, you mentioned having the right people around you. Um, you know, I know a lot of times in, 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 with the youth, they want to be <clears throat> the popular kid. They want to be accepted and they, they don't want to be different, but you know, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be the popular kid or the most accepted or the whatever. Just find a group that works for you. Find a group of, of support that works for you. Um, maybe that's the kid that eats by himself during lunch that go over and sit down and make a friendship, you know, you obviously. Both. Yeah. So that's just, that's my thing. That's about the only thing I would say, you know, always look for support, always find those who can help you be a better person. Hey, yeah, you know, th- there's so much, and I hope maybe any teenagers listening to this, um, you know, it, it's, th- there's a lot of time wasted on trying to be cool and trying to be kind of at the center. And, um, and th- there are signatures you can leave elsewhere that are really powerful, um, you know, infinitely more powerful than just kind of being temporarily cool and popular. And it, and if kind of being at the center is really, truly what's going to make you happy, that's, that's one thing, but but, you know, going back to what we were talking about, that about kind of spending time with yourself and kind of cultivating your own skill and, and learning how to love yourself and self-accept and everything, and then having the community of people that you can talk to. I mean, there, there are just so more, so many more doors you can open, I think, in that framework. And it's, it's difficult because, you know, being young is tough. It's really, really tough. And people are judgmental. And, you know, you, you don't want to, you, you want to be taken seriously. You don't want to be taken the wrong way. But... I think that that's kind of going to happen regardless, even to the popular kids too. And it's, I, 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 I know the people listening who are younger, uh, are, I mean, they impress me so much Amen. and, uh, I hear that. the level of ownership they have. And it's, it's really, really amazing. And, uh, they end up finding their own level of success. And I think that's what it's all about. I agree with that hundred percent. And, you know, I know I, I can only imagine if you know, the middle school youngsters, or the high school youngsters thinking these are two 40 year old or two old men in their forties. What do they know? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't, don't think of us as old people. We, we, we're, we're genuinely telling you what, what we believe and what we know will, will help you. Uh, I swear to you. Thanks for listening. I really enjoyed that one. Like I said, there was some excitement about Brian coming on. Uh, send some feedback, Podcast at gmail.com. There's also a contact portal at Tourette'sPodcast.com. Uh, take it to the Tourette's Podcast discussion group on Facebook as well. Thanks to our wonderful admin there, Sophia. If you get a chance, please tell her thank you for the work she does there. Tourette'sPodcast.com is where you can find all the past episodes, as well as at GeeksRising.com. Geeks Rising is the network that brings Tourette's podcast to a great, diverse listening audience and has connected me to fellow podcasters like Logan, Malcolm, and Zach, who do the On the Subject podcast, where they talk about movies and pop culture, impact, and lately have been doing so under the question, but is it cinema? Check them out at geeksrising.com. If you want to give individual support to Tourette's podcast, no pressure, you can do so at patreon.com slash Tourette's podcast. Thank you so much to everyone who backs the show. And of course, the Tourette Association of America, the primary sponsor of Tourette's podcast, they're making this possible. Like you heard in the discussion with Brian, they're doing a lot and they have a lot of focus points, all walks of life. They're growing their programming, evolving, science, social support, all of that, Tourette.org. Thanks so much, everyone. We'll be back next week with another episode. I'll talk to you in the meantime, too. This is Ben. <laughs>